Yeah, I'm just saying you're going to look at the video. Should they actually first They're drawing lots right now to decide who's going to come up here. None of us was to be. Cooperative The way this microphone works is you don't have to be that close to it, but it has to be pointing at you. Good, thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Paulson for Community Village Lawrence, and this is Chris Roberts, and we're going to show a little video that was on NBC News. You may have already seen it, but we think it's a good introdu introduction to our project. So, uh, Finally here tonight, our periodic series of reports called Trading Places, where we look at our own families and caring for our own aging parents, or in this case, in-laws. In the case of my mother and father-in-law, they have paid to join a group that allows them to grow old in their home. It's called Staying Put, and it's part of a growing movement made up of those who've decided the best retirement community is at home. Pat and Hud Stoddard have been married for 60 years, most of them spent in New Canaan, Connecticut, where they raised three children, including a daughter named Jane, who I married 27 years ago. Pat was a teacher, Hud was a public television executive, and over the years they put down deep roots in this town. She's 83 now and he's 91. They live in a comfortable home all on one floor and see no reason to move anywhere else. You have a lot of friends who have moved into other places. They've left their homes, they've gone to assisted living. They're happy there, but you must be very happy having your things, your clothes, your books, your memories, your television, you can stay here. It makes such a difference to have everything uh, that you t treasure that way and remember that way and wish to use again that way. The Stoddards are among the 300 members of a mostly volunteer local organization called Staying Put. And true to its name, it allows seniors to do just that. It's kind of assisted living for a living right at home. It's a one phone call away resource for whatever. You don't have to apologize for what your problem is and your need. They're used to that kind of thing. That kind of thing can mean a volunteer offering rides for my father-in-law who no longer drives himself. This is Pat Stoddard calling from Staying Put. Pat volunteers at Staying Put headquarters. The town's first responders are in on it, too. The first aid squad instructs staying put members to have a list of their meds and medical history at the ready. We're working together to make it easier for us and easier for them when they need us. Police, fire, EMS, know your address. The local carpenter knows you're here and has helped out doing work. It takes a village. It takes a village to raise a child and it takes a village to take care of two elderly people. The village concept started in Beacon Hill Village in Boston, and when the Stoddards and their neighbors and friends read about it, they started their own chapter. So this is a tripartite thing for you. You are a founder, you are a volunteer there, and you're a customer. You bet, because it's a damn good idea. <laughs> Scratch that down. That's all right. <laughs> Times have changed. I think maybe they go at the bottom. A 2013 AARP study found most seniors prefer to stay put in their own homes if they possibly can, and it can be way more affordable than paying for assisted living. The Stoddard's neighbor, Lisa Livingston, lives alone in subsidized housing where staying put volunteers deliver her medicine and provide her with some company. I think we've got to put our pine needle groupings. Actually, Even for those seniors here. with family living right nearby, staying put still well, offers yeah. peace of mind. You have three loving children and a whole big extended family and grandchildren. And you, big. <laughs> um, we aren't here 24 hours a day. There are going to be gaps. And so this is a almost a big blanket insurance policy for them. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And we've put more information on the Staying Put program on our website for you tonight. Some things you have to squeeze to make sure they're soft. Other things you don't. Good afternoon, I'm Mary Dunn. 
Renaissance, and I'm part of the Community Village Lawrence, and I get to start off this whole um, presentation that we have. We had the, I thought the Brian Williams just talk really lays it out very clearly. Mary, you need to talk about. directly into the microphone. Speak directly into the microphone. No, it helps when you're a short person, isn't it? Right. Actually, it's better. Well, I don't like that, so I'll hold it. Um, basically, Community Village Lawrence, for me and Lawrence, I retired and moved back here. And I was at a uh, meeting of the Lawrence Douglas County Advocacy Council, and one of the members said, hey, did you see the article in AARP about the, community, about the village movement? So it sounded interesting to me, so I was one of those that said, well, let's see if we can put this together. So a group of us have been working since 2012 to organize and put together the village here in Lawrence. We started on the east side of town, and we call it the east side village, east of Mass and North Lawrence, because we felt that was the, the community that would best, would best need our uh, services. But we quickly realized as we went along that just financially that the half of the city wouldn't, wouldn't be able to support it. There's just not enough resources. So I had a dream and woke up in the middle of the night and said, oh, that's just what it's called. I, I emailed everybody in the group and said it's now going to be Community Village Lawrence and the board voted for that. So that happened last fall. But um, for me, this is something to help for people helping each other, made of community members and volunteers to uh, stay in your homes as long as you want to. I think there's a lot of potential in this whole process. Uh, we've got a lot of information. We've been doing some community uh, meetings, usually on a Saturday, we call them a little breakfast. But we want to do a lot more of those just to get the word all over town. The, the community is defined by city limits now, so it's, it's a pretty big area. Just because people may be in whatever part of town you are, once if you're a couple and the spouse passes, then you're left in that house you may, may not want to leave, or maybe you can't afford to leave, but yet the house needs cared for and you need help caring for it. So I think we've got a, a lot of <coughs> potential. Um, I've been, a, been really surprised at the number of younger people and that say, hey, I want to help. I want to be a volunteer. So we've got some, a lot of things going. It's a good match of things. We hope to launch this summer as far as a full-blown service, but I'm going to pass on to Judy, who's going to talk a little bit more. I'm not sure what your topic is, Judy. Our strategic plan. Oh, well, before I give this to you, any questions on how we got started or any, any questions at all? Nothing so far. I'll give it to Judy. <coughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, I did want to tell you all that as, as from part of our history, we are a, a, a board of directors of nine people, uh, two of which are men, so we're not all women, though the women are here, to, some of us are here today. Um, and we have right now uh, Christopher Roberts, who is um, our VISTA volunteer. We had had two others before, but they kind of graduated out, and we are applying for um, another VISTA volunteer to help Chris out. So we, we do have his support and help, and he works very hard to, we, we had two at a time before, and he's carrying the work of two VISTAs right now on his shoulders, and we thank him. <clears throat> but this is right now strictly volunteer organization with the help of the VISTAs. Um, we have a, a house, uh, we are housed uh, right now in a variety of places. Lawrence Creates has been good enough to allow our VISTA to uh, work out of the office that's in there. Independence Inc. Uh, supports us in our uh, board meetings, which we have twice a month. And Trinity Lutheran 
church has offered us some, some space also. We're also, I'm chair of the finance committee and I'm Judy Ballone. Uh, some of you may recognize me like my friend Marilyn. Uh, I am a nurse, retired nurse, and had worked for uh, the last eight years as the director of the visiting nurses and hospice here in town. So this kind of program is near and dear to my heart. Um, last summer, we had our first retreat, and many of you may know Joe Bryant, who is the retired um, executive director of the United Way, was our facilitator. <clears throat> and she spent the day with us board members looking at who we are, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. And we set up some strategic uh, plans as well as some objectives that we wanted to achieve uh, in 2014 so that we could offer membership. Uh, at this point, uh, we are um, still in our building, infrastructure building phase. Number one was we, as the chair of the finance committee, looking at what the amount of money that we needed to support ourselves is we wanted to raise $60,000 to meet our 2014 budget. I'm here to tell you we're not there, <laughs> but I'll tell you how we plan to get there. Recruit board members to achieve a board of 13. We currently have nine, and uh, those of you who have been on boards before know that there's not an exact number that makes things work. We have a number of people who have volunteered to help with us, uh, help us and, and also work in committee work with us. And we have a number of people that um, might be interested in joining us in the future. So that's kind of an ongoing uh, plan of ours is to continue to look at uh, attracting board members uh, to help us because we are a working board. This is not a policy, just a policy setting board. This is a working board and a donor board <coughs> and a uh, volunteer group. <clears throat> Develop a marketing plan. We are engaged in that. Um, we have not completed that, but we have uh, a committee and we are working in that. Uh, form new, five new committees. Well, basically because we just got over a fundraiser that um, I know Forrest and, and his wife were at this Sunday. We had a, a big fundraiser over at Crown Toyota Showroom that uh, we put a lot of our time and effort into preparing for that because it actually was res rescheduled from March 2nd when we had our last big ice snow and ice storm. <coughs> So we had to reschedule and, and bring off a fundraiser at a second time. Um, create volunteer and member handbooks. That's actually been done. And we're very lucky, as you saw in here, there are other villages. <coughs> There's over 110 across the United States. And we're one of probably, uh, and I'm guessing, uh, somewhere around 25 that are in the process of organizing themselves. Mary's going to tell me differently. 125 in, 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 that are going, and another 100 that are forming. Another 100 that are forming. So this is a, an idea that's really catching on. Uh, we said we would host recurring town hall meetings, and we have. Um, we have um, had five town hall meetings, and we are looking at developing, trying to develop one um, every month or more, so if there's one you'd like in your neighborhood or your community, you can let us know. And when we call them town halls, it would be a group no bigger than this and, and could be smaller, could be six to 10 people. Um, you wanna hire a part-time executive director, uh, 20 to 30 hours a week, and, and we really need that piece of the puzzle so that at a headquarters, though we can have volunteers helping with scheduling and volunteer training. You've got to have a paid staff person in charge who can uh, 
be part of the leader and decision maker and part of the leadership to work with the board. And we don't, we don't have the financials to do that yet. Recruit 30 volunteers and develop a criteria. We've done that. In fact, uh, the person who will be speaking later, Ellen Paulson, will talk about um, a volunteer program that we have right now called Telephone Reassurance Plan that works with both the police and the fire department. Um, we hope to launch, and that means start offering membership uh, this summer, but it frankly depends on our ability to raise the necessary funds in order to um, pay for the kind of training. Besides the volunteer programs that you heard about with transportation <clears throat> and uh, telephone reassurance and calling, uh, there is a part that brings in service providers at a reduced rate, like roofers and plumbers and folks who will do some of the outdoor work, maybe cleaning your gutters that you can't get a volunteer to do, but they would offer this service at a reduced rate if you're a member of the village. In order to do that, we have to, from a legal standpoint, make sure that they their backgrounds are checked and they're vetted and that they have a contractual relationship so that they will offer a reduced rate and you can feel confident in not only their ability, but um, their honesty. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're doing. This time frame is, is based on uh, our best guess. Um, we are looking for a sponsor. Many of these other programs around the United States have a corporation that's a major sponsor, which helps them out with startup funding and then is kind of a sponsor throughout. We've been exploring Douglas County looking for that business that might be a sponsor, and we haven't found it yet. So that's part of our strategic plan. We have another one planned with Joe Bryant's coming back to take us from where we are to where we're going to be um, in July. And, and we're glad to have her helping us and working with us to go forward. And um, I think if you have questions, maybe ask them at the very end after we get through presenting our little pieces of information to you. Thank you. Ellen? have to carry my security blanket with me. I'm not a public speaker, so I like to have something in writing. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, can you hear me? Am I talking into this correctly? Pointed at you. Pardon? Pointed at you. Oh, like this? Okay, thanks. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Telephone Reassurance Program, which is the program that we have that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, it's, um, and, and we have brochures that are available here. They look like this that will, you can take home with you in case you don't remember every word I say about the program. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little background. I'm originally from a rural area in central Kansas. Um, I don't know if any of the rest of you lived on a party line in the olden days. Oh okay. Um, as a child, we didn't have electricity. Our one exotic in the house was our telephone. And you know, it was the crank telephone, we were on a party line. And the thing I remember as a child is the sense of community you had because if there was an emergency, usually a fire uh, or a child that had fallen into the pond or into the silo, whatever, there was a line, and I a number that you, or not a number, a number of rings that you did. I think in our area it was one long and ten shorts. Does anybody remember what the emergency call was? One long and two shorts. I think you're right. It, well, it was one long and two shorts in my neighborhood. Okay, okay, so when you heard that, you weren't obligated to answer. If you had a crisis of your own, you stayed home. But everybody else listened and rushed to help each other. I guess that's why the telephone is kind of, a, for me personally, it's kind of a lifeline to support. And I know as a young mom, I remember one day my two little boys ran down the road and they to me and they said, Mom, Mom, there's a little, somebody bleeding all over coming down the road. Well, it turned out it was a little neighbor boy, way too young to be driving, but his folks had sent him to the field with gasoline for his older brother, rolled the pickup, uh, was thrown out, and the pickup had rolled over him. I don't know how the child walked, 
But anyway, I got him into our car, told my oldest daughter, <coughs> it was her 16th birthday, I said, honey, call the emergency room, tell them we're on the way. So my, another daughter was holding the child and I said, keep him awake. Well, we drove as fast as I've ever driven in my life trying to get to the local hospital. The hospital, of course, didn't believe a child calling and saying there was an emergency. They thought it was a hoax. And I didn't know that, but I did know that my car was overheating. I would have given anything for a cell phone in those days. But I ended up ruining the engine of the car, but we got to the hospital in time, and the kid is alive and well today. So it had a good ending, but telephones have been a real crucial part of my life, as you can tell. <clears throat> so when we heard about some of the villages using the telephone reassurance program, they call it different names, but what the process is, if you live alone or if you live, uh, perhaps your um, partner uh, would not be able to get to a phone if you uh, uh, hurt your head, and had a concussion, if you passed out, whatever, and you don't know how long it would be before someone knew you had an emergency, it's, it's reassuring to know that at least once a day somebody's going to call and say, are you okay? Um, is everything going well? I'm part of that program both as a volunteer, I call, I'm also a recipient because I have five lovely children who look after me and love me, but they don't call me every day and when I don't answer, they just figure I'm at some place like this. Uh, I had a concussion three years ago. Fortunately, it was in my front yard, so I was pretty visible. But if it had been my backyard, it could have been two to three days before anybody looked for me. So I'm very pleased to be a recipient of the program, and I like being the person that makes a security call for someone else. It gives me a sense of being useful in my older years. Um, plus, I think not only is it the safety issue, I think we need that connection with each other that we've lost, that we used to have when we did depend on each other a little bit more. I think we need to recognize that again, that there's not going to be an agency that takes care of us all, but maybe we need to look out for each other. The way this program works, if you would like to have a phone call or you know someone that would, we have a simple form. Chris can help you fill it out. Uh, we ask that you, of course, give the telephone number or if you'd rather get a text or if you'd rather use Foursquare that Paul told us about any of those kinds of methods of a daily contact. You fill out the, the application. We also request that you give us some backup numbers, a child or a friend that could check on you if you don't answer. So if we call several times and you don't answer, we call the fail-safe person. If that fail-safe person can't get into your home or for whatever